Welcome to another Texas In Conversation. My name is Corey Turner, Senior Director of Healthcare Product Marketing here at Texas. In this interview, we'll be speaking with Greg Swanson and Tom Seliquini, both managing partners at National Medical Logistics, to discuss consolidated service centers. A centralized supply chain network can empower your organization in more ways than one, from source to patient across the health system network. A CSC will effectively and efficiently enable cost savings and quality care. Today we will discuss how healthcare supply chains can profit from a consolidated service center and value it can generate for global visibility. So thanks for joining me today, Greg and Tom. Uh, before we begin our conversation about our consolidated service centers, uh, can you please introduce yourselves and just tell us a little bit about your backgrounds? Sure. Hello, Corey. This is Greg Swanson, managing partner with National Medical Logistics. Tom and I formed National Medical Logistics uh, about 19 years ago now when we left uh, corporate vice president positions with McKesson Medical Group. And we had varying responsibilities and operations, uh, running distribution facilities in the field, um, running corporate inventory control, and Tom can get into his background in that as well as other areas. And we decided uh, those 19 years ago that we wanted to step out of corporate America and take the skill sets we had developed over the years in our medical surgical distribution backgrounds and provide it in a neutral way, if you will, in that we don't have a sell through agenda, we don't sell product, we just support probably 90% of the time our work is with provider hospital systems, in particular the larger integrated delivery networks. Um, but that's uh, my background briefly, Tom. Yes, good afternoon. I'm Tom Seliquini with National Medical Logistics. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, my background is also in uh, dis distribution, healthcare, it's specifically healthcare. Uh, with McKesson Medical Surgical, uh, back in the days, <clears throat> there, it was, uh, we serviced all market segments. That was hospitals, physician practices, extended care. And, and I had the distribution network uh, under my responsibility. And at the time, we had gone through a number of acquisitions and acquired other distributors. And at one time, we had about 80 distribution centers nationwide. And so I had to take on a project that sort of rationalized the, the DC. So there was a lot of right-sizing of facilities, applying technology, updating uh, standard operating procedures. And then I had a group of uh, folks that were consultants that would go out to the hospital industry and, um, and sort of consult with the supply chain to bring low unit of measure programs all through McKesson. And so as Greg mentioned, we took that experience and sort of launched into NML where we're offering our clients uh, those experiences. And it just so happens that um, uh, cons consolidated services centers right now are, are actually trending. So um, our experiences fit nicely into that niche. Yeah, we're definitely seeing a, you know, a rise in conversations with IBNs around CSEs. Uh, so again, thank you guys both for, for, for joining us today. Um, your experience will really just tie right into this conversation nicely. So <clears throat> let's jump right in. So Greg, I'd love for you to start us out. Um, what is your experience in assessing and implementing kind of a CSC supply chain model for, for health systems? Right. Sure, Corey. Um, we tend to want to take a look at their supply chain fairly holistically. And w the way National Medical Logistics approaches it is in basically a three-step process. The first one, the first phase, is to take a look at the present environment and what their strategic objectives are and come up with all the analytics and all of the operational requirements and costs that would be necessary for them to have this consolidated service center. If you, if you will think of it a little bit, we kind of coined the term medical mall because what a consolidated service center really is at its core is a logistical facility for hospital systems so that we can reduce the number of vendors and trucks that show up at the hospital's dock itself, put them all on one vehicle and consolidate those activities, so support services. Yeah, I think in some instances, we've actually found hospital systems that um, where the burning platform was actually some of these ancillary services. Um, so, for example, that we had one, one client where 
uh, their uh, storeroom was located right next to their SPD, their sterile processing department. And they couldn't, uh, the sterile processing department was sort of uh, wedged into a small area. They, they needed more space. And so that was the burning platform was to create more space for SPD by removing the storeroom into an offsite facility. So in some instances, it's not just uh, the medical surgical product distribution piece. There, there are other reasons for getting into to, uh, uh, the distribution. That uh, valuable space within the hospital, right? Absolutely, right. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's there's different models that are out there now, too. So there's the what we call the wholly owned self-distribution model, mm -hmm. which is the the health system sort of disintermediating the distributor and going directly to manufacturers to procure their products. And right. by doing that, they gain control of the supply chain. They're able to negotiate better deals with the manufacturers and actually participate in some of the buy side incentives that are offered by manufacturers. And so that's one model that that's out there. Another one is a distributor partnership model where they're actually asking their distributor to perhaps build a facility for them, run it, operate it, and allow the, the health system to bring in ancillary services that they themselves would, would own and manage. And then the third option is uh, what we're calling a redistribution. And that's simply a health system acquiring an off-site distribution center and then continuing with their relationship with their distributor. In that example, the distributor would ship their product to their off-site warehouse where they would redistribute it to their, their health, health, uh, healthcare facilities. Yeah. So it's really, it's really not just a one size fits all. It's a, you know, there's different approaches and that flexibility or variation really depends on, you know, what, what does it depend on? Well, it depends on uh, whether or not the health system wants to take on the initiative, it, it, what level of involvement that they actually want. You know, a lot of them actually do want to contain uh, or, or maintain control of the entire supply chain. Uh, so in that example, they're going to have to, you know, put out capital, you know, uh, develop uh, standard operating procedures, probably get systems involved, right? And then there's real estate uh, so it's it's a big endeavor, and and um, I think they need to go into this with their eyes wide open. Yeah. So Tom, um, you know, a consolidated service center is is uh, really a powerful tool to help take control of your supply chain network, right? So kind of give us um, what are some of the key factors that a health system really should be considering in their decision to pursue this, this type of model, a CSC model? Yeah, great question. And I think, you know, this past 18 months with COVID, I think a lot of uh, healthcare systems are starting to look at supply chain, uh, maybe giving it a little bit more um, attention than it has in years past. Um, and I think, um, you know, they need to consider, first of all, the timeline that it takes. How long does it take to actually go from uh, as Greg mentioned earlier, a business case where, you know, we're actually looking at what is it potentially going to cost you? What is the timeline associated from going from zero to fully implemented? What do you need to do from um, your your staffing perspective? Um, and so, you know, understanding that timeline is the first first key thing. And I think, um, you know, senior, senior leadership has to have um, – a vision for what they want to see supply chain be. And they have to understand that they've got to keep and maintain that vision through that timeline. Uh, you know, so it can't be the, the, the shiniest object in the room now that they steer their attention to. Uh, they definitely need to be, you know, stay the course on it. I think uh, volume makes a big, a big uh, impact. Um, we used to think that there had to be a, a certain threshold of med surge volume in order to consider self-distribution. And I think there still is. But again, I go back to that burning platform issue. If you have other issues that are uh, more important, uh, then you can have $20 million worth of spend, 25, 30 million, I think is on the low end uh, before you should even consider this. Um, and then some of the ancillary services that we talked about earlier uh, could, could come in into the medical mall that Greg was talking about. Right. And there's a lot of value that come from those ancillary services 
that we, you know, we typically look at individually to you know, perform a business case on each individual service line to determine uh, you know, whether or not it's viable. Greg? Right. Well, over the years, we've also seen a few factors that uh, tend to support uh, the higher level of success of an implementation toward a CSC by an IBN. Um, one of the things that's always beneficial is to have a reasonably high density of geographical proximity for the acute care facilities. Uh, for example, if you have a, if there's an IBM that has just, let's use 10 hospitals, but they're in seven different states, that creates a whole different logistical model and therefore that CSC may not be in the best interest, perhaps a national distributor model is better suited for them. We can be done, but it significantly increases the cost. Uh, another thing is relative to cost is that capital outlay. Um, you, if a, a hospital system, you decide if they want to lease a building or if they want to own it, since they're always going to be in the business, it's not uncommon for them to want to own the building. Well, then you're talking about several millions of dollars of capital upfront investment just in a physical real estate building then as Tom mentioned, systems and labor and so on. Um, and so those things just impact the strategy and the vision. And then finally, one of the real success factors that sometimes uh, we have to bring to the attention of the IDN is the need for C-suite or senior management level champion. Um, they need to uh, be cheerleaders in the process because once it's engaged, it's a multi-year activity to get mature and effective and efficient. So you don't go into it unless you're serious. It's like diet and exercise. Some great things can happen, but you have to stay at it. <laughs> right. So that's great. Yeah. It's a, you know, the, there's just, there's so many takeaways that we can take out of that. Um, uh, and I appreciate, you know, both your comments on that section, but, you know, Tom, you know, let's circle back to, kind of the uh, impact. So, you know, health systems may not be aware of the uh, the overall positive impact a CSC can make. You know, we talk about, you know, there's capital, there's there's this huge project, you know, you have to have the, C the, the senior suite um, buy into that. But, you know, I want to focus on, you know, you know, the overall positive impact of those things. You, you know, it can make a huge impact on your operational activities. Um, you mind elaborating a little bit on how how many of these areas can greatly benefit a benefit from a CSE? Sure, I think another good question because um, I, I think once you get into a CSE and you own the supply chain, you own it. So yeah. um, you, you can uh, control a lot of the upstream activity uh, and support the backstream activity. So, for example, um, how long has product standardization been an issue in healthcare? I mean, at least since I've been in it for the last 40 some years. Yeah, that's right. Um, what this actually does, the CSC again creates the environment to support standard product standardization. So, you know, if you have a distribution center that you now own, uh, if you're tr you're continuing to be all things to all people, then you're going to really, you know, your SKUs are going to proliferate, right? And it's just going to get out of control. So, you know, that's just an an offshoot of what the CSC can do, but that is something that is being solved with the CSCs. Uh, the other thing is, uh, and not only are we talking about product standardization, uh, we're talking about um, rationalization of manufacturers too. So uh, in, in doing that, you no longer have to have, you know, five different uh, can liners, you know, from five different manufacturers and, and five different colors, right? So you, you standardize on all of that. And then you look at what the, how the CSC is performing these services to the end users, uh, and you can control order cutoff times. You can now look at uh, what are the best times to make deliveries uh, and, and consolidated deliveries when you start including these OR PPI products into your distribution center uh, and using cross-docking services. You're now consolidating everything into one order delivery to, the, to each of the, of the facilities. So forget about the financials, just on a service related uh, uh, perspective, it, you can really improve service and, and actually increase and improve patient care. This is great stuff. So, um, Tom, uh, can you can you share any, you know, 
just general customer stories that that have really successfully implemented a, you know this CSC model, whether it be a small or large uh, IDN or you know a rural hospital, whatever that is, and, and you know some kind of an operational improvements that they may have seen. Sure. One comes to mind is out in the uh, mountain states, and they have about 23, 24 hospitals within the system. And they started out thinking, well, you know what, we'll, we'll go out and lease a 100,000 square foot facility uh, out near near the airport. And then uh, so we brought Greg and I in to, to help them understand, you know, the business case and then the implementation timeline. Uh, and then during the course of sort of doing the business case and, and getting them geared up for what was about to occur, uh, a, a member of the board came up and, and said, you know, I've got this land that I'd like to donate to the health system. And so it went from a 100,000 square foot DC leasing facility out near the airport to a fully owned, uh, constructed uh, 300 and some thousand square foot facility in, oh, right wow. there uh, near them. Yeah, it was, it was huge. Um, and, but it was, a, you know, it, it took a huge 180 degree uh, you know, out of phase kind of approach, but it, it actually went really well for them. They had a lot of um, supply chain offices scattered around the, the city, uh, and so they were able to consolidate all that into the, into the new facility and, and bring all of supply chain together. So they had the sourcing and contracting and the AP, and then the, you know the distribution folks all under the same roof. So they were able to to operate and interact much more fluently. Uh, and 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 uh, so they brought a lot of benefit to the organization because they they also had uh, still have a quite a big uh, career um, operation, right? Eighty to ninety vehicles, and so wow. that became a logistical hub for them. Yeah, um, just streamlining they, that that group of you know supply chain, you know logistics, everything in the one area. Exactly, and then the uh, you know future phase, they they brought in all their physician uh, business. The physician practice business. So, oh, wow. and, then, and they have a home care business too. That's uh, you know being handled out of the DC. So you know that's one. It, it I think that probably took uh, two to five years for them uh, from the very beginning of the business case, uh, and then the planning, and then the, you know putting together the project management teams, and uh, until they actually opened the doors for business was probably three. Four years, I think. And I'm sure that didn't start off as like a one big bang. We're going to take over, you know, all the supply chain, bringing in, we're going to take over this courier route. So we're going to, you know, so I'm sure there was kind of a phased approach to that, right? There was, yes. And they looked at it very uh, logically. And, uh, you know, they started with the med surge product, bringing it in. Uh, and then they, they advanced into, they have a pharmacy operation out of there where they're doing a uh, 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 repackaging, unit dose packaging, compounding, uh, and um, quite a few other services. They have a telehealth group out of there. At least they did. I don't know if they still do. Right. Um, so there's quite a few others. And there, there, there are variations within IDNs too. Tom mentioned the one out in the inner, inner mountain region of the country. Um, in the Southeast region, we've worked with several that have evolved through the med surge, as Tom's talking, the initial phase tends to be, and really developed some very successful savings programs associated with their ancillary service activities. Uh, one of them in particular decided to uh, become an LLC, so they didn't have to be associated directly with the hospital's typical budgeting processes. And, and they became a standalone organization. Standalone organization to enable them to have their own budget, their own, uh, you know, revenues and their own expenses and so on. Um, they're still owned and operated, if you will, exclusively for those hospitals. But in that instance, then they sell their, their product and their pick pack ship activities to other providers, even, even emergency uh, type response units that are in that geographic area. So, the the model to tom's point is not only multi-phase but it's multi-year because it takes a number of years to get to that level of sophistication because you have to do it in bite sizes because it's because it impacts the whole supply chain 
you know, we've seen certain uh, instances where, um, as Greg was alluding to, but where, where you've, uh, health systems have taken the CSC and they've sort of commercialized it, right? So in other words, we're going to take what we can do out of this CSC and sort of sell it to, to other uh, IDNs. Uh, and, and of course, that has its own separate issues, but it's a lot easier to do that when you're a standalone entity and you're not part of the health system. Um, so it's just easier to do. Yeah, so one of the, the, the biggest things I've taken out of this conversation is, you know, the CSD um, model is a huge model. It's a huge undertaking for uh, an IDN, but there's a there's a, a large number of benefits, operational efficiencies, cost efficiencies. You know, there's lots of gains uh, that you can really pinpoint, and you guys do that with customers, you know, all the time as far as kind of mapping out the process. Um, you know, Greg, kind of on this kind of final question, how, um, and Tom, feel free to chime in here as well, but how would you approach an organization that's kind of just on the fence with a CSC? You know, there's, you know, a lot of people we hear that, you know, their volumes aren't enough or, you know, they don't feel like they can, you know, do it themselves or for whatever reason. We, we hear, we hear, you know, uh, reasons and, and things a lot that, that people just don't want to get into this for, for whatever reason. Kind of kind of give us a little bit about how you would approach an organization and then kind of some initial steps that an organization should take to implement one, you know, into their health system. Right. Okay. Um, absolutely. It probably comes down to uh, their capability for overall longer term success based on their size. Uh, because, of course, distribution in general, healthcare included, you increase your efficiencies through increased volumes through the distribution facility. Um, so you incrementally, your cost to serve goes down as your volume goes up. And so the larger systems have an inherent advantage to that respect. But we would sit down with them and we do what we call a three-phased approach. The first being a, a business case assessment. Just where are we as an as a integrated delivery network? How do we compare to some of our peers in terms of what's going on? That enables them to make a go or no-go decision. Now, the no-go decision might mean that we need a distributor partner to come in because we don't want to put up capital and so on. But maybe we want to own the building. Maybe we want to uh, own certain activities, including the system, and have uh, another group, a third party logistics firm do the daily operations. So there's all kinds of one offs, um, but that that's determined in that first phase. Then the second phase is the deeper dive uh, and project planning for the infrastructure and the build out and the staffing, et cetera. Then the third phase is your go live and your support processes with it. Yeah, I think as part of that phase one, uh, the business case, you, you know what? What we intend to do as part of that uh, assessment is to sort of lay out to the health system, the supply chain folks, here's what we think it's going to take. Here's the size of a building we think you would need. Here's the staff that we think you'll need to operate it. And based on your volumes, you know, we would project a certain layout within the distribution center. We would layer in whatever technology that we think they would need to have. Uh, and we look at the financials and we say, OK, we, we know that your spend is X and we know that if we bring in uh, your PPI or direct products into this, we know that what we've seen in the past, there's an X percent benefit in terms of price point reductions associated with that. And we know that if you can negotiate these self-distribution contact uh, contracts with these manufacturers, that you can negotiate another reduction in pricing. And so we lay all of that out to them and we say, you know what, this is what it looks like for you based on what your objectives are. And here's how we think it's going to play out. Do you want to proceed or not? And I think that's, that's a very first uh, important phase uh, to answer your question, which is if they're on the edge, if they're on the fence and, the fence and they're not sure, then we would suggest that they have somebody do a business case or, or they can do it themselves. Uh, but sort of lay out what, what the projections are. And then they can say, do we want to go or do we not want to go? Yeah, they really uh, need to know what direction, I guess, the organization wants to go in first, right? I mean, it's kind of like, is, yeah. are we ready for this as an organization? Because, again, it's a cultural thing, too. You know, it is. It's not just, 
Right. It's not just uh, how we can save millions of dollars on this, this, and this. It's, you know, as an organization, what are we wanting to do? Or do we want to take on this kind of project? Exactly. That's exactly right. And we, we, we try to avoid becoming, uh, if you will, CSC salespeople, because uh, it's not right for every IDM. Um, and in that business uh, case portion, that first phase, there have been a few that we've suggested they not start when they want to because they have disparate platforms. They may need to do data cleansing. They are just in the midst of an, of an acquisition of additional hospitals. They've got uh, multiple cultures. So you, you, they, they are perhaps well positioned, but not right at that moment. Right, right. Do some housekeeping right. activities and we can go through that with them. And then you prepare yourself to get that supply chain all centralized. And we've been involved with a couple of uh, uh, scenarios where uh, a group of IDNs are banding together uh, in order to create the volumes needed to, to sort of uh, uh, make it work. And so we've modeled, we've done some business cases for groups of uh, systems that come together and, and, and play nice and uh, build a distribution center for them. Yeah, so I think, you know, the biggest thing here is, you know, and I, I, I think the same message that you guys is, uh, is speaking to as well is that, you know, CSCs are not for everyone, but they can be based off of whatever your model is going to be. So, you, you know, like you said, it's, it's based off of volumes, it's based off of size, but it's also based off of culture. You know, if you're ready for the, mm -hmm. a type like this, you know, and, it, you know, I'm sure you guys would agree with this, there's pieces of the pie that are right for the picking you know it's kind of like one of those things to where yep. if you want to get into you know um let's say ppes in an emergency warehouse you know there's there's levels of this that that you guys i'm sure could help and and help these organizations kind of walk through yep absolutely well great so you know greg and tom you know i i thank you both very much for just kind of sharing your knowledge with us today um this in conversation piece with you guys has been very insightful Hopefully, you know, our, our viewers will get the same kind of information that they're looking for. Um, so we really appreciate you guys' time today. And thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Corey. And thank you to our viewers. Um, if you need support with integrating a consolidated service center within your healthcare organization, Texas is here to help. At the end of this video, you have the option to speak to one of our health um, healthcare supply chain experts, or you can access our ebook on the top 10 reasons why you need a healthcare consolidated service center. So good luck and I'll see you all next time.